Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Detecting DC Sync and DC Shadow Network Traffic. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Michael Cohn and Didier Stevens. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our presenters. Hello, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining Didier and myself here today. So starting with a quick introduction, I'm Michel Kuhne. I'm a senior manager at Enviso, where I look after our incident response and threat intelligence services. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also an instructor for the SEC 599 course, Defeating Advanced Adversaries, Purple Team Tactics, and Kill Chain Defenses. Hello all, and I'm Didier Stevens, a senior analyst at uh, Enviso. So that means that I do mainly malware analysis and incident response for our clients at uh, Enviso. And uh, I'm also a SANS Internet Storm Center, a senior handler and a Microsoft MVP. So today we are going to talk about, yes, you guessed it already, DC Sync and DC Shadow. So I'll be giving the introduction into, okay, what is DC Sync? What is DC Shadow exactly? Um, a bit towards the analogy of how we actually handle our 599 course, our purple teaming course, where we're also always looking into, okay, how is an attack actually working? How are the attackers executing this attack within your environment? It also showing the hands-on or doing the hands-on part yourself and during the course, for example. From there on out, we'll move into, okay, if the attackers execute something like this within our environment, how will we detect that? And this is the detection part that the DA will talk about, um, where he will actually present some newly created IDS rules specifically for DC Sync and DC Shadow network traffic. Of course, we're always thinking, but how could an attacker circumvent our detection rules? So the DA will talk about that as well. And if you have any questions, just like Carol said, Feel free to enter them in the questions section here in Zoom, and we'll be happy to answer them after the presentation. But let's first take a look at what DC Sync and DC Shadow actually is. So both of these attacks are actually built in into Mimikatz. So Mimikatz created by Benjamin Delphi, and together with Vincent Letou, uh, Benjamin actually Benjamin and Vincent, they created on a number of attacks against your Active Directory. And what they're doing here is actually impersonating a domain code. So when you look at your own corporate environment, I can guess, you probably have multiple domain controllers present there for availability reasons, of course, and also to make sure that not one domain controller constantly gets overloaded by all of the authentication requests. I probably have domain controllers spread all over the world. Now, those domain controllers, you want them to be at all at the same state. And let's say um, this afternoon, I thought, okay, it's been a while, um, I will change my password. Good. So I changed my password on my machine, this will happen against one specific domain controller. Now, if I try to authenticate to a certain resource within the network, let's say 30 seconds later, it might happen that I'm actually authenticating against another domain controller within my environment. Okay, I changed my password here, but now I'm authenticating there. You want that there is some replication between those Active Directory databases as soon as possible. And for that, Microsoft has the domain replication services traffic where all of the domain controllers within your environment are actually constantly updating their Active Directory databases with the new updates that are being performed by your users, changing a user, um, changing a password, uh, but also by your domain administrators, changing descriptions, for example, for users. So with these attacks, and starting with DC Sync here, um, what we will do, or what Mimikatz will do for us, we will actually impersonate a domain controller and we will make some good use, as an attacker, we make some good use of that domain replication traffic. So we will say, hello there, I'm a domain controller. I would like you now to replicate the user account administrator with me, for example. 
And through that domain replication services traffic, that account will actually be synced with me then as the attacker. So if I have just a regular computer within my environment, I run Mimikatz on it. I, of course, need to have the privileges to do that uh, domain synchronization and need to have domain administrator privileges, for example. Um, the domain administrator, of course, has those um, DC sync privileges itself. Um, so with that, I will say, look, I'm a domain controller. You can now sync all of that information with me. If you think about it, this is pretty much the same or has the same impact as if we would actually be going on the domain control and just copy over the NTDS.bit database file, the, the entire database file from your Active Directory. So pretty, um, pretty good attack there. It will give you lots of information. How is that exactly implemented? Well, DC sync is actually fairly simple. Well, with fairly simple, I mean the execution of the one command there. You, of course, need to have elevated privileges within the domain already itself. So there's one command that we need to run, lsadump colon colon DC sync, and then we say slash user for the user administrator. So all of the information that we have within our Active Directory database, our ntds.dit database, will now actually be synced to our terminal. So we can see here, we now have for the user administrator, we have the NTLM hash, we have the AES hashes there as well. We even have the previous password, the old password hash, the previous password hash there as well. So pretty good information. This DC sync attack will give you all the information there is about it, that is located within your NTDS database. The next attack that we're looking into is actually DC shadow. Now, DC Shadow also relies on that domain replication traffic. It is, however, a bit of a different attack. So while with DC Sync, we wanted to get stuff from our Active Directory, from our NTDS database, from our domain control, what we're going to do with DC Shadow is actually we are going to change items, change attributes within the Active Directory schema. We're going to change data immediately in the database. This could be, for example, uh, the password hash of a sensitive account. Um, this could be adding a specific user to a security group, adding a user to the domain administrator. Think about yourself. If within your own environment, if somebody would add a user to the domain administrator's group, would that trigger an alert within your environment? Very likely, yes. So you have specific rules set up for that that say um, a new event ID is being created, saying this user is added to a security enabled group, added to the domain administrator security enabled group. That's probably something you want to look into. Now ask yourself, where is that Windows event log created exactly? It is created on the domain controller, on the system where you actually make that change. Now, here in this case, why is this a stealthy attack? Well, in this case, the system that is going to make that change is actually the laptop or the machine of the attacker itself. Yeah? There is no Windows event log created for that. So we're really going to, in memory, create a change in the Active Directory schema. And then we are going to say, look, we're now going to register ourselves as a domain control. We're going to use that domain replication traffic to push out that change to the rest of our domain controls. That's going to sync across your entire enterprise. And then we're going to deregister ourselves or our machine as a domain controller. With that, there is actually nothing present within your environment that says, well, Michelle is now added to the domain administrator. So very, very uh, stealthy there. Um, even if you see, and, and what we'll see with, uh, with when the DA explains how you can detect this type of traffic, even with that, it will be very hard to actually identify, okay, what exactly was changed within our Active Directory. Okay? What user was changed, what uh, group was changed there. So it might be very, very different. One thing we can do, and I'll tell you that immediately, one thing you can do to also detect that, aside from the network traffic, is also look at, okay, a new domain controller was registered and immediately deregistered. So it goes very fast. That's something you do need to enable within your audit settings, uh, but you could find it out that way as well. 
how does this attack actually work? Well, this is a two-part attack. So first thing we need to do is actually um, run the first step, craft the change, craft the Active Directory change within our um, um, as anti authority system on our machine. So we're going to elevate our command prompt to anti authority system here, and then uh, do a token colon colon elevate within Mimikatz. And then we craft our change. So this is LSA then colon colon DC shadow. We're going to say, good, we're going to change the description of the administrator object to DC shadow was here. We're going to let that run. This is in memory. Now we're going to open a second Mimikatz window as a domain administrator in an account that actually has the privileges to sync that traffic, uh, to uh, enable that uh, DC sync traffic. And we're going to say LSA dump colon colon DC shadow slash push. And this will then trigger the change. Now, of course, it's always nice to show this in slides and you don't have to believe my slides exactly for that. Um, so let me show you these two attacks and show you how easy they are to be executed. Of course, if you already have the correct privileges within your environment. Um, whoops. So I'm trying to log in without making any mistakes here. So as a first part, we're actually going to do the um, DC sync attack. So we're going to go here to our Mimikatz folder, run it as a domain administrator. Uh, voila. And there, of course, we are now logged in as a domain administrator. This is with domain administrator privileges. So here we had the, as we remember, the easy command saying, um, as a dump, colon, colon, DC sync, slash user, colon, administrator. Well, and there we get all the information about our administrator user here. Very nice, very good. What we also can do, of course, with this one is um, the same one, but for our KRB TGT account. KRB TGT account, this, of course, if we have this password hash here, this is an account password hash that we can, of course, then use to create a golden ticket, for example. Next up then, we of course have to start as an elevated command prompt. And so then the next one is um, DC shadow. So this one we will run as an administrator again, so that we can elevate our command prompt to actually system. And will you do that uh, by actually using PSXX? Voila. And then I'm going to just cheat a little bit, not to make any typos here. Uh, it's in this one. Voila, I agree to that. So we now have an elevated command prompt that is actually running as system. We're going to start Mimikatz in this one. We do token colon colon elevate so that we're now running as anti-authority system. And then we will actually be crafting our change. So this is the change that we craft as the system user, which is then kept in memory. Again. Voila, this is now kept in memory. With the next step, while we are here in our Mimikatz window, which we still have open, we can now say as a dump, colon, colon, DC shadow slash push. Before I do that, let us take a quick look into the domain controller because, well, you could of course say, ah, oh, Michelle, you already changed it up front. Oops. So 
So we see here, what I'm going to do is change the description of this built-in account to DC Shadow was here. Let's go back to our Windows machine, push the change. There we go. That's how fast it goes. It goes really fast. So we see here, first part, it, we are actually saying uh, we have our um, machine fake server not already registered. It's my Windows 02 machine. We're going to perform the registration, do the push, syncing is done, and immediately perform the unregistration. So let's now go have a look at our domain controller. We just do a quick refresh here, and there we go. DC Shadow was there. So let us now take a look on how we can actually detect that specific traffic within our environment. Okay, thank you, Michel, for uh, that nice demo. I see that uh, the demo costs were fa favoring you today. No, no issues with the demos. So uh, for me this time, um, uh, unlike often when I present this time, I will not do a demo. So uh, I, I have to, not to deal with demo gods today. <laughs> so let's go into this. Okay. So Michelle here showed you the DC sync and the DC shadow command. And, and of course that generates traffic. Eh? In a normal situation that would generate network traffic between two domain controllers, okay? But here we are actually dealing with a workstation, a compromised workstation and a domain controller. And that's where we have that network traffic going over the network. And that is something we want to detect. So we need to inspect this. Uh, one way is to position our IDS in the network somewhere between those two entities. Uh, or you can find other solutions, like for example, have a remote sensor somewhere there. Anyway, you, you need to capture that traffic to be able to inspect it. Between uh, workstations or member servers, and on the other hand, domain controllers. Now, <clears throat> when Michelle did the DC sync command, at that time, there was network traffic going between the workstation and the domain controller. And I have here a screenshot of that network traffic. What you see here is uh, that network traffic captured by Wireshark. And I use a display filter, the DCE RPC uh, display filter, uh, the distributed computing environment remote procedure call display filter, because that is the type of protocol that the domain controllers use to replicate uh, DC information. And so you have here different packets going between these two machines. And I'm pointing out two uh, packets here, packet 28 and 41. Packet 28, as you can see, is a DCE RPC call. And this is a bind call. Okay. Now, what this bind call is, is the fact that our workstation, so Mimikas here, wants to use a particular interface, an API. That's what this call says. And then you have other traffic like binding. But then, Another important one is here in packet 41. This is a DRS UAPI function. So that is DCE RPC uh, protocol. And on top of that, you have DRS UAPI. So that is the directory service replication service and the API for that. And that is the protocol, the UAPI the protocol. And here you have a call to a function a request. And here you have the answer. The function is DS get and see changes. So that is what the DC sync command does. It, it asks for all changes to send all the data. So that is in the request response that we see here. So what we want to detect are these packets. Now, as you see here, I have two packets. The first packet is, is that bind command. I want to use the DRS UAPI API. That is what Mimikat says. And the other packet, packet B, is I want to use that change function. Now, 
in the communication in the protocol, you don't see the actual name of that function. What you see is a number for that function, and it's uh, function three, op number, uh, operation number three. That is not only for that DNS, uh, sorry, DC sync command, but there are other functions in other APIs, other APIs than DRS, UAPI, that also use number three, okay? So that number three is not unique, that function three is not unique to DRS UAPI. So, so to properly detect this, you need to know that one, the API DRS UAPI is being using, and secondly, that it is function three, okay? So what we do have here now is that we have two packets that we want to detect. Now, is that possible to do with one rule? Well, I here developed tools to do that a, a couple of years ago. I think it was in, in 2017 when um, I, I got the idea uh, when uh, I was working on the, the SANS course, SIG 599, uh, when I was working on that course, I got the idea, well, let me try out if I can make uh, suricata detection rules. And that's what uh, I ended up here with the rules that I'm going to show you here first. So we have two packets. Can you detect that with one rule? Well, typically no. What you actually have to do is two rules. You need one rule for a packet. So two packet, two types of packets, two rules. But of course, there needs to be some kind of link between the two, these two rules. You just, as a, as a stock operator, for example, you don't want to see yeah, rule A triggered and, and now rule B triggered. Eh? What you want to see is rule A triggered and rule B triggered. That's what you want. Eh? So you need to link both rules. And in Suricata and, and Snort, for example, and I imagine that it's also possible in uh, other IDS systems, is that you can link those rules, eh? make a connection between those two rules. And in Suricata, and also Snort, we can do that with flow bits. And I'm going to explain in detail how that works. So here I have my very first rule. So this is for packet A, okay, the DRS UAPI. And this is for DC sync, the first rule. Now, first of all, so this is the actual rule. I have spread this over different lines, okay? That makes that this rule is no longer valid. Eh? Snort rules and Suricata rules, they have to be on one line. Mm? But I split it out, the different clauses here, I split them out over different rules so that I can better explain them. So the first thing what we want to do is generate an alert. Yeah? For TCP traffic, here we are going to work at a low level first, TCP. And we are interested in any traffic that is coming from workstations. Now, in my example here, the rule I do workstations, but you are best also to include any member server in there that is not a domain controller. Eh? From any port to a domain controller also on any port. Uh, that is the traffic that we want to inspect. Now, why any, any port? That's because of the DCE RPC protocol. Right? You don't know upfront which port will be used. Okay, the message that will be displayed, Mimikatz DRS UAPI. Now, I call this Mimikatz because that's my ID. That was my ID. I want to make something to detect that uh, Mimikatz traffic. But actually, this will also uh, detect legitimate uh, replication traffic. If you put this between domain controllers, then this rule will also trigger. So for DRS UAPI, the flow Okay, we want a connection. We want the connection already to be established. And we are looking at uh, the flow to the server, so to the domain controller. Now, if you look into the packet capture that I just showed you, and you drill down into that bind uh, packet, you will see that the very first byte is number five. So, so of the DC RPC uh, data, that is five. And then here, that is the version number. So that's the version five of the protocol. Here you have the minor version zero. And then you have the packet type. So this is a, a byte 
packet. The value is 11, and as you can see here, hexadecimal B. So hexadecimal B, that is decimal 11. So that is the first thing I want to detect, 50B. And that's what I have here in this clause. Content at the beginning of the, pack, of the data packet here, I want to see 50B, and that is a depth of three. The next one, I want to detect that that bind command is for the DRS UAPI uh, function, uh, API, sorry. Now, the name DRS UAPI will not appear in that packet. What is used is a UUID. Eh? So this, uh, there's a unique 16 byte identifier for uh, that interface and that is the UUID. That's what you see here. So here in the Wireshark dissector, you see the UUID. And this is how it looks in the packet hexadecimal dump. And that is how I put it here in the rule. Yeah. The only thing to pay attention to is the difficulty with the binary representation of GUIDs and UUIDs. There are certain conventions to it. In this case here, these byte sequences are taken as is so from left to right. But the other one here, 4B06, that one is taken in reverse order. Okay, so if you look here, you see 35, 4B06. And if I look here, I see 35, and then here 0C, 4B. So that is reversed. Okay, so that is why I, in my rule here, I don't have to take this representation of the UUID but I need to take this representation. So the binary representation, that's what I put here. Okay, so when I have those two conditions, eh, a diversion and the right UUID, I know that I have a bind packet for um, that DRS UAPI. What I'm going to do now, and that is just a design uh, decision that I made here for that rule, is that I'm not going just to send out an alert. What I'm going to set is that flow bit flag, okay? A flow bit is a flag that is um, particular to that flow. And, and a fl you can look at a flow as, as a connection. So it's a set of IP addresses and a, a source and destination and ports, yeah? If, if these things remain the same, then you are dealing with the, the same flow. And the flow bits command that I implemented here is I'm, saying I'm setting the flow bit and I name that flow bit DRS UAPI. It's like setting a variable name in a program. Okay. Now that is the first rule. I'm setting that flag. Second rule here is to detect the use of the DNS, DS get NCC changes. So a request for that function. What I do have here, my first condition is testing if that flow bit is set. So is DRS UAPI flow bit set? Is it set? Then I will continue, okay? If it's not set, then I will ignore and pass on to the, the next rule. And then here again, similar to the previous rule, version five, minor version zero, and this time, instead of a bind, it's a request, and a request is zero. So I'm testing here for five, zero, zero. And then next thing, using that DS get NCC changes inside the DRS UAPI uh, function, API, sorry, that is actually number three, see? Operation number three. And if you look, at the representation inside the packet data, it's 0, 3, 0, 0, okay? At a certain position, uh, position 22 here, and that's what I implement in this clause. I'm looking for 0, 3, 0, 0, at offset 22, and the depth is 2. Okay, so when I have these conditions, sorry, when I have these conditions, the rules will trigger, and I will get an alert. I will get this alert, Mimikatz DRS UAPI, DS get NCC changes request, and I have detected uh, that traffic. Now, that rule 
here. Why does it trigger? First of all, because the, the flow bit is set and uh, thus uh, the first tool detected that DRS UAPI interface, that's one thing. Secondly, because I have here detected that that DS get NCC changes function is being called, okay? And that detects our uh, DC sync traffic. And this is a rule so that I developed a couple of years ago, the, these two rules. And, and I do know that uh, they um, are very efficient. I mean, I know of a couple of organizations that uh, have implemented that rule to in, in their production uh, network uh, and a couple of uh, people inside those organizations have let me know that uh, they, they are very efficient. By that, I mean, they have no false positives. Hmm. Now, again, they are looking at that traffic between member servers and domain controllers, eh? not between domain controllers, eh? because then you will have alert. Eh? But in that case, they have no false positives. And, and the true positives that they had were indeed uh, all red team exercises. So they were pretty happy for the detections uh, provided by that rule. So that was DC sync. Now let's look again at another traffic, DC shadow. Eh? When Michelle did the DC shadow uh, demo, then also traffic was generated. And here I'm showing you that traffic. So what you see here, this packet 74, that is again a bind to the DRSU API. So that's what we want to detect. And this time I'm going to detect another function. The other function that I want to detect is called DRSU API replica at. So that function is uh, particular to the type of replication traffic that you will see when DC shadow commands is being used by Mimikatz. And now just to point out, here at the bottom, you can also see a DS get NCC changes, okay? So when DC shadow command is being executed, then you also have at the end of the traffic that DS get NCC changes request. So the previous rule, the DC sync rule will also trigger here for DC shadow. But what I did recently here, uh, I also implemented particular rules for DC shadow. Right. And they are quite the same. So first of all, I can use the first rule, the rule A eh, that detects DRS UAPI uh, UUID. I can just reuse that. Eh? So here in this rule for DC shadow, I can just do a test for DRS UAPI, that flow bit, okay? I'm also looking for a, a function call. So 500 eh? using a function. And this time the operation number is five. So instead of five, I need to test for three. So the only change that I need to make here to my previous rule to make a new rule is 0500. Of course, there are some other uh, administrative changes that you need to make. For example, the message needs to be different because otherwise you will not be able to distinguish both rules. And also your ID for the rule, you, you have to choose an, another ID. But uh, so it turned out to be rather easy to, to make a, a DC shadow detection rule. It was just a slight modification of the DC sync rule, just looking at the use of another function, okay? Now, a couple of remarks about those two set of rules. First of all, I have implemented my rule for packet A that it sets a flow bit and also that it doesn't generate an alert, okay? That clause, flow bits, no alert, you could decide just to remove it and to have also an alert just when a bind to that DRS UAPI uh, API is made. Hmm? Because also, again, in normal circumstances, you will not see that DCR, DCE RPC traffic. Hmm? A, a workstation that wants to use the DRS UAPI interface of, of a domain controller, that's not a normal situation. Even if you have a domain administrator that is administrating the domain via um, uh, his administrative tools, it, it will not use this traffic. Okay, so you could also just remove that flow bit and have one more uh, alert. 
that's a modification uh, improvement, for example, that you can do to the rules. Okay, now what we have shown here are two uh, rules, two set of rules, and they are at a quite low level at the TCP level where we really have to go look in, into the packets. Now, let me just point out some interesting things that uh, uh, you, you should know about that, that are uh, important to know about when you are designing rules to that, and also that can help you improve your rules. And what I'm going to talk about is endianness. Mm -hmm. So to detect that, uh, that function, function 0, 3, eh, you need to detect op operation number 3. So what is happening here in that network traffic is that the value 3, the number 3, is transmitted over the network, and that is done with two bytes. Okay, And when you have to do that, you have two options to do this. You can decide, I'm going to first send 0, 3, and then 0, 0. Or you could do it the other way around. First 0, 0, and then 0, 3. Okay. Now, in our example here, in our traffic, it was <coughs> zero, 0, 3. It was 0, 3, 0, 0. Okay. But in theory, you could do it the other way around. 0, 0, 0, 3. What is the difference? Well, that's the endianness. Um, when you start with the least significant number, 0, 3, and then the most significant uh, part of that number, then we talk about little endian, eh? because it's the little end that you put first. And if it's the other way around, we speak about big endian, eh? because it's the big end that you put first. Eh? So if I would have, for example, the number 255, hmm, that is just FF. So that would be FF0 in hexadecimal. If I have 256, that is 100. Zero, zero. So I would have here, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. Then I would have here 0, 01 and here 0, 00. Okay. So that is the difference between little endian and big endian. It's the way uh, how numbers that are represented with bytes are transmitted over the network. And it's not only in the network that you will find that, you will also find that in files and in memory, for example. Now, if we look again at our traffic, we see here for function three that it is 0, 3, 0, 0. Here you see 0, 3, 0, 0. So this is little endian. Okay? The traffic is little endian. But now when I dug a bit further into the traffic, into the uh, result of the dissector for the DCE RPC uh, traffic, I saw that there was a field called data representation. And the info with that field is order little endian character ASCII float IEEE. And here you can see byte order little endian. So inside the DCE RPC protocol, there is actually a flag that tells you that the data is being transmitted either little endian format or big endian format. Okay. Now, in my experience uh, in, in Windows um, traffic uh, between domain controllers and, and here with Mimikatz, I have only seen little endian format. Okay. But when you dig a bit further, you, you see at least that the protocol supports both, that you can also have big endian traffic. And then when you see something like that, uh, you, well, depending on what kind of role you, you fulfill, for example, if you're a blue teamer, you might think, okay, maybe I need to make some more generic rules, uh, something that will also handle big endian. That's one thing. If you're a red teamer, you might thinking, okay, this is working with little endian, and I know that there are rules to detect this when it is little endian. Maybe I can detect by... I can bypass uh, detection by using big endian. Okay. So what I did next is to develop rules that will work both for little endian and big endian. Here are the two rules, and that is for DC sync. I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm going to show you just what the difference is. 
And these are the rules for DC shadow. So if you want to test out these rules, you can get them here from the slides and we will also make a, a blog post. Now, what is changed in these rules is the following. First of all, I have added these two clauses. This is a byte test, and I'm not going to explain it in detail, but we did this byte test. I test if the flag is set for little endian, okay? If the flag is set for little endian, I'm going to check for 0, 3, 0, 0. And in the other rule, I do, I do it the other way around. I test if the flag is set for big endian, okay? If the flag is set for big endian, I do the test 0, 0, 0, 3. Okay, so that is a um, uh, generalization of our rules to, to make them more generic. And like I explained, uh, this is something you, you might want to look into. Uh, and depending on your role as a blue teamer, you might get the idea, okay, I want to make something more generic. So I'm going to account for the case that this might be big Indian. Uh, it's not what we see normally. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in attacks and, and in red team uh, exercises, abnormal traffic also happens. <laughs> something you, you see uh, quite often in, in those cases. So uh, it's something you can account for. And, and for the red team, that is something you can try out. Eh? Can I pull off a, a DC sync command with um, big Indian numbers? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for full disclosure, I, I looked into the Mimikatz uh, source code to see if uh, it was uh, easy to change. And I actually didn't find a code that builds up the packets. Eh? The, the code that uh, Benjamin developed, uh, his uh, C++ uh, source code interfaces with the DCE RPC interface uh, of Windows. Eh? And this uses by default the uh, little engine convention. And I have not seen directly an, a flag in that API to change the convention, but it is something you can test out uh, that you can uh, build your own functions or, or take an open source library that do theirs, that API and then switch it to big engine representation. Now, what we did here now, here we developed different sets of rules with a bit more abstraction than for the endianness. And here I'm going to show you even more abstraction. What we did until now was at the level of TCP. Uh, we looked into the TCP data. Yeah? Suricata has also a processor specific for DCE RPC traffic. And if you want to use that, instead of in your rule to say alert TCP, you say alert DCE RPC, and then that preprocessor will be used. I think I, I said uh, dissectors uh, just earlier, but dissectors, that is a term of Wireshark. Yeah? And when we are talking about uh, ideas like Suricata and Snort here, uh, uh, we talk about preprocessors. Yeah? And when you have that preprocessor, then the, the functionality, the, the rule to develop becomes much easier. So you have again your rule with the message and here your flow established to server. And then instead of going to look inside that TCP packet, you just have to say, if I see the DCA interface with that UUU ID, and if I see a DCE opnum with that number, then the rule has to trigger, okay? And you don't need to care anymore about endianness. Eh? You don't need to think about, is this little endian or big endian? That is what the DCE RPC preprocessor does. And also here for that representation that I told you, where this is reversed, this is reversed in, in binary, depending again on the endianness. Well, that's not something you, you have to care about. The, the preprocessor does this. Hmm? So, why did I develop those TCP rules when you could do, can do this with DCE RPCs? Well, there are a couple of reasons to that. First of all, uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2017, when I did this, uh, the, the first rule, because these are new rules, but, but this rule, I, I tried this and it didn't work. Right? It just didn't work. So I, I had to rely on TCP to, to do the detection. And it's only uh, a couple of months ago 
when when I revisited this to to prepare um, the, this webinar, it's only then that uh, I started to dig again in this, and then something has, had changed uh, in 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 relation to what happened in 2017. When I did some Google searching, I found a discussion by uh, Suricata users and developers that mentioned a, a, a bug here. So I don't know exactly if it was in the interface, if I'm not mistaken, it was here in DCE interface, but there was back then a bug in Suricata so that this would not trigger properly. It, it just didn't work. And indeed, when I saw that and I took uh, a new version of uh, Suricata and, and I tried this out, then it, the detection worked, okay? Uh, then I could use the interface. So back then I tried it, it didn't work, and, but it was because of a bug. That's one thing. Second thing is you can also have older versions of Suricata or limited versions of Suricata that are installed where that preprocessor is not active because these preprocessors also take computing time and they take CPU cycles. And sometimes such preprocessors take too much CPU cycles they, because they have to do a lot of parsing and so that they take too much time to do the too much CPI cycles to do the processor and that the administrator or the network administrator of that idea decides I'm not going to activate that uh, DC or PEC uh, preprocessor. Huh? So either you have an old version who doesn't support it or, or is even buggy or, or else you have a, a, a limited uh, CPU where you cannot actually run this. And in those cases, you cannot use that rule. So then in that case, it's good to be able to fall back on, on the TCP one. Okay. So to summarize, we in 2017, uh, we, we developed the first rule to this, uh, detect DC sync. Then how here, this year, we, we developed uh, another rule for, for DC shadow. And we also made some generalizations uh, with, for example, the endianness. It's something you have to pay attention to. So if you are looking into traffic, network traffic to detect this, uh, you can do like I do literally match the packets that you see. But if you have time, then it's useful to take a, a step back and think about what you're doing. And if there is not a more generic way to do this, like, for example, with that DCE RPC uh, preprocessor. OK. Now, the rules that I mentioned here, we will be, so you have them here in the slides, of course, but we will also share them in an upcoming blog post, and you can find them here on our blog. And uh, so this upcoming blog post, it's already written. Uh, it needs to go through our internal review, and I expect that it will be published in the next week or, uh, or two. Okay. So with that, I thank you. And uh, I will now, we will now take uh, the questions. Okay, first question is the UUID of DRS UAPI constant. Yeah, indeed, uh, it, it is constant. So it, it is specific for that DRS UAPI. Right? What might change, like I explained, is the representation in the packets themselves and that the order might change. And that depends on, uh, on the endianness. Okay. Uh, a second question, what is depth? So indeed, um, let me go back to the slides. Mm. Let me take a simple rule. Okay, almost there, yes. Let me now get, okay. So question is about here depth. What is depth? Well, depth tells the IDS, in this case, Suricata and Snort, how far into the packet it needs to search. And here I'm just doing a, a very limited search. At the start, I want to search for three bytes and I only want to start search three bytes into the uh, packets. Okay, so I'm not going to look further into the packet if I find 
0.5000. So the net effect is this, is that I want to match 0.5000 at that exact place, okay? So that is something you do with uh, depth. Does the Suricata rule DCE or PC preprocessor create false positives due to the alert DCE or PC? Any, 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 any. Yes, of course, it will generate uh, these alerts, false positives, of course. And that is because it will also notice traffic between, legitimate traffic between um, domain controllers. So let me go back to that rule. That hole here with any, 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 that is indeed an example. Eh? You need that to tailor that to your environment. Just like I did with, with the first hole, you have to go from non, from member servers and workstations to domain controllers. That's what you want to see. Um, another question, uh, couldn't this be detected by the domain controller event log instead of relying on a ideas within the network. Uh, DC should rarely be added, so I wouldn't think this would generate too much uh, false positives. Can you, can you take that question, uh, Michel? Yes, absolutely. So indeed, if you have your auditing policy set up on your domain controller to say, okay, is a new, uh, new object added there? Uh, you can indeed detect it. And detection rules, there are detection rules out there for this, absolutely, um, where you say, look, a new domain controller was added and immediately removed within a very short uh, time frame. So it's definitely a, another way, uh, another good way of detecting something like this going on. Um, with security, we always want to think about the concept of defense in depth, of course. We want to uh, make sure that we can rely on, on multiple detection rules if we have the opportunity for that. So this is a way on how you can detect it from a network perspective, looking at your domain controller logs, at your auditing logs there, uh, absolutely uh, true as well. I think in, uh, the event IDs that you would be looking for are the 5137 and 5141, but that's just from the top of my mind. So. Don't quote me on that one. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Now I see that I uh, skipped one question and that question is, is the Mimikatz DRS API message in DC Sync Rule 2 something that is always found and can it be modified or removed by the, by the attacker? Well, it, it actually isn't in that uh, second rule. So let's go to that second rule. Okay, so there is, there is no test for the presence of that DRS UAPI UUID inside that packet. It's not present in that packet. It is in the other packet, in the first packet, packet A. Here you have it. And when I detect this, I set the flow bit. And then in my second rule, I test if that flow bit is set. And that flow bit is not something that is inside the packet. That flow bit is a variable, an internal memory state of the IDS. Okay. Uh, DJ, how do you identify the packet from the packet capture that are relevant? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. How do you know what you have to look for? Well, that is something that I did not explain here. But um, back in the days when I did analysis, I, I read articles and explanations uh, by Benjamin and other people on understanding exactly how, how that uh, DC sync command worked, uh, not from a point of view of typing in, but from the, the traffic that is going on. And then uh, I saw, okay, the DRS UAPI interface is always involved. So, one way or another, I need to know when that interface is involved. Eh? And I found then that packet, that bind packet. So that's the first packet. And then I also knew about the uh, get NCC uh, command uh, function. Eh? So function number three, eh? DS get NCC changes. And then I implemented that one. Eh? So that's because 
I, I knew about that uh, because I had traffic and also had descriptions of how it should look like, and I knew what was uh, relevant. And, and then also for the for the DC shadow, there. Um, let me go to the DC shadow one here. So here I, I looked into the traffic and, and trying to understand how it works. And so what DC shadow does is replicating traffic changes. And I did some lookup of the API, how the DRSU API worked. And I understood that if you want to do that, that you then need to add a replica, use that function add replica. So I realized, okay, if you do that, then you need to detect this. And then the last question, these are network traffic inspection based rules. Do you know if Windows event log based detections are also uh, possible? So I think that's a, a bit the question you answered, eh, Michel. Yep, yep, indeed, indeed absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay then. Uh, thank you all uh, for your attention. And uh, Carol, uh, are you? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. You. Yeah, thanks so much, Michelle and Didier, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.